So this is my twin turbo V10 Nissan Patrol. And in the last episode, I left you on a bit of a cliffhanger, mostly because I was embarrassed about saying a bunch of garbage and then doing exactly the opposite of what I talked about. So let's find out the deets. So yes, let's talk about the elephant in the room. While I eat my virtual pie. And in case you don't know what I'm talking about, there's the episode where I talk about ECUs and how I'm not gonna be using aftermarket ECUs. Quite naturally, I was bullied in the comments. Haltech, eh? This just got interesting. Oh no, had to go to Haltech. Oh well. There's so much more potential with the Haltech. Haltech coming, hmm, interesting. How do I look on that big screen of yours? You get the idea. I said I wasn't gonna do one thing, and then I end up doing that thing that I said I wasn't gonna do. And here we are. So let's rip off this band-aid and get it over with. Hey Google, find my phone. Haltech, you sent me the wrong thing. This is a dash, not an ECU. What do you mean a Haltech ECU doesn't work with a V10 PD diesel? Wow, it's almost like I covered this in a previous video. And out of the 11 old thousand people who watched this garbage, only one of you knew this. So congratulations. We should all know by now that I don't make mistakes. Anyway, with all that housekeeping out the way, let's find out why I am using this dash instead of the one that comes with the factory car. And this is pretty much for two reasons. Firstly, in one of the previous episodes, I experimented with trying to see if I could make wheel speed sensors work with this car. Turns out, as I expected, it wasn't a plug and play ordeal. So I'm sacking that idea. The other one is, since I'm using Nissan Patrol controls, like indicators, headlights, handbrake warnings, and such like, it means that these are obviously not gonna work with the CAN bus system, seeing as it's a separate circuit. So the good thing about this is that I can have all the OBD stuff coming to this to display my check engine lights and engine stuff. And seeing as it has a heap of extra wires and pins on the back, I can then manually plug in speed sensors, all the lights that I need, and anything else I may need in the future. So that's why. Thanks, Ambassador. Two idiots try to hump a tire. <laughs> now, unfortunately for this part of the build, I have to make a compromise that I'm not particularly happy with. For almost the entirety of this build, everything has been done and it's kind of met my standards. But this is one of those things that I can't really get around. Now CAN bus works relatively independently from all of the other systems of the car, and the bridge between them is something called a CAN bus gateway. And what this does is it allows all the computers to connect with each other. Unfortunately, mine is actually built into the gauge cluster in this car. So sadly, removing it is not really an option, and due to the style of the CAN bus that it's using, there isn't a module that I can just simply swap it out with and hide it somewhere. So the unfortunate truth is, I'm gonna have to hide this gauge cluster behind where my speedo goes. Which is less than ideal, but as long as I can just forget about it, it won't be a problem. Ah! Now this is where the pre-planned convenience of this build sets in. Because seeing as I've got the Nissan Patrol wiring in here as well, what it means is, I have these two connectors that connect to my CAN bus gateway and speedo that's gonna be hidden away. And then I have these three connectors, which are related to the dash cluster that was from the GQ Patrol, which obviously I'm not using. However, all I have to do from this side is find out which pin corresponds to the light that I'm trying to activate and just pin it into that. So yes, part of this episode is gonna be a wiring exercise. And to begin with, I have these two cables. This one is the pin that goes from the dash to whatever I want. And the whatever I want is this OBD2 cable which is independently powered. So that's step one. This will be powered from the same wire that powers the GQ dash, so that whenever I turn it on, it'll also turn on the dash. So maybe I'll put this as an overlay. That's the diagram for the GQ dash. And that'll be paired to this wiring diagram I don't have on my phone. Simple as that. Now I'm gonna start with switched power, which should be this bottom right-hand pin. And obviously you can't always trust wiring diagrams. So let's see should be no power now. 
No, it's 12 volts. Why are you 12 volts? That's why. Maybe you'll see this, maybe you won't. That currently says zero volts. When I turn the key on. Now it says 11.6 volts. My battery's a bit low. Shut up. So with that one wire, this should work when plugged in. Never done this before, probably gonna blow up. Hooray! Now as I touched on before, this doesn't do much without the CAN bus gateway fitted. So just for now, I'm gonna be installing this before I do the rest of the wiring. Now as with everything, fitting that dash is not gonna be a straightforward process. Here's why. Typical Volkswagen garbage. I'm not pointing at anything in particular. A different shot attracts more attention. And the main reason is CAN bus. And CAN bus is not a one shoe fits all situation. And in this case, the shoe is a bit different. This car at the OBD2 port uses something called K-Line. And this is a relatively outdated way of doing things because the data rate is pretty bloody small. Most cars use regular CAN which has data rates of around a megabyte a second. But it gets better. Different shot again. Engagement. This car also uses various CAN bus systems for groups of modules, which then collect it into a CAN bus gateway where it is then K-Line. I don't know why. And what this means is, out of the box, that speedo does not work with this ECU, or set of ECUs, or set of modules, or CAN bus system, which gives me two options. One option would be to use the entire dash as a standalone unit and add my own sensors like coolant, whatevers. And this would be a really crap idea because it would completely eliminate the stuff that gives you check engine lights and the useful information. The other option is to do something quite terrifying. And that would be to butcher the entire wiring loom that we saw in the previous many episodes, somehow find the relevant CAN bus circuits and then tap those into the Haltech display. And that is why this is something I'm gonna complete in the background because nobody wants to see wiring. Now, a while ago, I made these bonnet strut things to hold my bonnet open, funnily enough. And something surprised me. And this was that people were actually interested in how I calculated the force needed to keep this thing open. And I like this for two reasons. Firstly, because it proves that people are actually interested. And secondly, it means that I can explain some very simple maths and people will think I'm a genius. So let's begin. So the first part of this marvelous process is gather your information. This bonnet weighs about 25 kilograms. It is 1.2 meters long. And we have to make an assumption. We assume this is a homogeneous piece of metal. That means that it's the same density all the way through. And if that's the case, that means we can measure half the height and approximate this point as a point load of 25 kilograms. We could also approximate this angle here as about 45 degrees. So if you're hilarious, you know what an ugadugger is. And this is a form of measurement. This is basically Newton meters. Newtons is force times a distance. I'll do it up here because it's easier to see. So we know the force, 25 kilos from here. We know the distance, but it's in the wrong units. We're in kilograms. So let's just convert that into Newtons now. You do that by multiplying it by gravity. Congratulations, you now know how much torque this bonnet is putting on this hinge. And now comes the slightly more tricky part. We know how much force this bonnet is pushing down, so we have to counteract that by calculating how much, given these dimensions, is required to push the bonnet and keep it up. So, here's the goal amount. We basically have to take those same measurements that we just took again from a different point. Now to make things easier, during the design process, the angle between the bracket and the ram worked out to be 90 degrees. It's almost like I planned this. And this is because it makes things a million times easier. And I like easy things. It's probably easier to do these measurements without the bonnet in place. Because now you can see this without it being basked in darkness. So I'm doing a bit of guesswork here. I'm gonna take this as the horizontal plane. I'm gonna assume that this is about 45 degrees above the horizontal plane, and this bracket is pointing 45 degrees below the horizontal plane, which approximates this angle 
as 90 degrees. It's almost, not quite, but this makes it easier for me to explain it. We also have the edge of the bonnet here, but the hinge is somewhere down there, which extends the moment by about 100 mil here. And we can also measure this point to the pivot point of this as also being about 100 millimeters. So, using black screens and triangles, we know that the bonnet will exert this much of a moment on this hinge, given these angles. That means you need to find the sine, cosine, triangle things. And if we just take these forces into account, the bonnet is going to fall down with this much torque. Now the bracket is there to counteract this. And we know this information based on the triangly bits. So the absolute minimum we need to stop the bonnet closing on our heads is this much. Now in the previous video, I said around 500 to 550 newtons of force would be a usable amount for these rams. These numbers look a little bit different, don't they? There's two rams, aren't there? And that means that the required force is basically halved to keep this just at the point where it's being held up. And obviously that's not ideal, because it means that if someone comes along and goes like that, it'll close. So you have to add some security, which is why in the previous video, I came up with a figure of about 500 to 550 newtons, which means that it would take a few kilos to close this, which is pretty standard. And in the end, because of RAM availability, I ended up going for a 600 newton meter RAM, which means that I'm pulling here probably with about five or six kilos of force to close this. And there's, there's no danger of it ever being closed by wind or anything like that. So now you know. You know what's coming next. That's all, bye.